Parks Midweek message and uh, grateful that you're tuning in with us. Uh, hope that these are really helpful to you and are keeping you engaged in the Word of God uh, throughout the week. Um, I want to talk to you today about uh, face fallen anger. Face fallen anger. We get this from Genesis 4. Uh, verses uh, 6 and 7, Genesis 4, verses 6 and 7. You'll probably know this when we start studying this together, or remember this when we start studying this together. But face fallen anger is what this is titled to. Uh, how often there, are you struggling with anger? How often is that part of your day or your week? How often is anger getting the best of you? Or let me ask you this way. How often are you disappointed with other people's performance? How often are you let down, uh, grieving, grieving in your heart over what uh, they failed to uh, accomplish um, and, and do what you wanted them to do? How often are you let down by people like that? Um, if that's the case, it, it's likely that you're struggling with face fallen anger. So would you grab your Bibles? Uh, Genesis chapter 4, very first book of the Bible we're going to be studying together. And this is going to be really helpful to you if you'll dig in here and really allow the Word of God to be the one that diagnoses your spiritual condition. Don't let anything else do that, by the way. Let the Word of God be the only instrument that diagnoses your spiritual condition. Don't come to that conclusion on your own. Don't let other people tell you what that is. Let the Word of God show you what you're really dealing with, and particularly with anger. That's one of the hardest things for people to identify, what is going on with them in their heart of hearts when it comes to anger. So you ready to go? Genesis chapter 4. Uh, this is verses 6 and 7. We'll jump right in here. The Lord said to Cain, this is God speaking to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. You must rule over it. Sorry, that was my phone. It was my friend Clay, who's a jerk, by the way. <laughs> oh, that guy. Anyway, so, face fallen anger. Listen, uh... When you see the word sin is crouching at the door, the phrase sin is crouching at the door, its desire is uh, contrary to you. That's a Hebrew word that is the word marshal. It is to rule or reign over you. That's what sin's desire is, to rule and reign over your heart. Its desire is to rule you, and you must rule over sin. Uh, but how often are you ruled by your anger? How often is that happening? The Bible says when we're ruled by anger, that is sin. The Bible doesn't say that anger is a sin, but when we're ruled by it, that's when it becomes sinful. Uh, be angry and sin not. Do not allow the sun to go down on your anger. That's to be ruled by it, right? But notice what's happening here with Cain. God is speaking to him about his anger. Why are you angry? Why is your face fallen? And then he God tells him without even getting the answer to that question, if you do well, will you not be accepted? What's going on there? What's happening there? The guilty conscience is what's going on there. The guilty conscience is also an angry one. The guilty conscience is an angry one because guilt is the problem. Guilt is the problem. Guilt is the problem. It's not, uh, it's showing, it's indicating that you're not right with God. Guilt is not a feeling. Shame is the feeling, like Pastor Lynn always says, that comes with guilt. But guilt is uh, not a feeling. It's the verdict. It's the verdict. You're not right with God, and that's the main problem. But when that's exposed, that you're not right with God, and you're not doing things in a way that pleases God, when that's revealed, guess what's going to happen? Anger. You're going to be angry. And our sinful pride helps us to cover up that problem quickly. Uh, we we don't uh, you know sit well in having that anger or that guilty conscience exposed. We get mad uh, when it is, and we and we start to tell ourselves sinful lies about our guilt. We start to run to our pride really quickly. In other words, Psalm thirty six one and two talk about that how we flatter ourselves in our own eyes uh, quickly, too quick, and we can't even detect or hate our sin anymore because of that. Romans 1.18 describes that as suppressing the truth. When the truth is revealed, we push that away. And Cain was angry with God for not accepting his offering. That's the context. Cain is angry with God, and he's justified in his mind. Cain is justified that, that his anger is right, that he should have a problem with, with what God is doing here, that he's 
uh, in the right, so to speak. And that's the problem with man's anger. Because man's anger demands that God accept us on our terms. Boy, how often is that happening in the world today, right? People are just demanding that God see it their way and accept them on their terms. And that's man's anger. It's, it's to reverse the roles, putting God uh, in the position where he needs to come to our saving conclusions. A person who cannot move past their anger is demanding that their saving conclusions are uh, arrived at. That's what you need to come to. And when you don't arrive at those conclusions uh, that they've told you that you should be arriving, um, their face is fallen. They're, they're let down. They're disheartened um, because they're, they've set their mind on a conclusion that is outside of the true saving power of God. So there's no Holy Spirit there. Watch now. There's no Holy Spirit comfort in that. There's no Holy Spirit to lift their head. As Psalm 3, 3 would say, But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory, and the lifter of my head. But this is face fallen anger, a person that will not be consoled. Uh, the person remains entrenched in anger, inconsolable because they are mastered by sin. They've allowed sin to come in the door and rule their hearts through their anger. They've opened the door wide for sin to come in and rule them, refusing to properly do what God instructs. That's the root, that's the root issue, that they're the guilty conscience, they're not right with God, but they've quickly suppressed that, pushed that away, and that's what the unregenerate soul will do. If you're going to just do that and do that, that means you're not saved. A person that's saved can't keep doing that, in other words. You can't keep suppressing the truth and pushing it away and, and, um, and never arriving at God's conclusions as you should consistently. You know, uh, These are unregenerate souls whose, whose works are not accepted by God. They're opposed by God. And Christ is not their aim. Christ is not their aim because their soul is void of him. David says true believers uh, do this. They, say to, they, they ask God, say to my soul, say to my soul, I am your salvation. That's what the true, genuine believer wants. For God to say to my soul, I am your salvation. Psalm 35, 3 is where we see that. Cain did not desire this kind of salvation. He knew, Cain knew his offering wasn't right. He knew that. He suppressed that. Cain's offering was about Cain. And God called him on it. And he became angry. What in particular was wrong with Cain's offering? I think that's the right question, right? Why wouldn't God receive it? Well, turn in your Bibles to Hebrews 11 for we're going to let Scripture uh, interpret Scripture here, right? Hebrews 11, 4 explains what was going on, the differences between Abel's offering and Cain's offering here. Hebrews 11, verse 4. Are you there? Here we go. By faith, by faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him him by accepting his gifts and through his faith though he died he still speaks that's saving faith right there why was abel's offering accepted and cain's rejected abel offered in faith and the bible says without faith it what impossible to please god hebrews eleven six. what kind of faith pleases god saving faith What's the difference? Well, saving faith is faith, listen now, saving faith is faith that comes from God. It's faith that's, that comes from Him. It's displaying love for God because it comes from God who is love. Uh, Hebrews 12, 2 says, looking to Jesus, what? The author and finisher of our faith. God begins our faith. That's true saving faith. Uh, Hebrews 11, 1 and 2 says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the, convictions of th the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. 
Uh, Galatians 5, 6, Paul says it this way, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. So let's put all that together. Both assurance and conviction come by way of the Holy Spirit. Faith is not something we can conjure up ourselves. Uh, it's something that is God-given. You see that when Peter confesses to Jesus, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, and Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because that was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. The Holy Spirit causing uh, Peter to recognize the value of Christ and who he was, right? And the Father authorized that validation. That is saving faith. Abel displayed God-given understanding and conviction that a once-for-all-time sacrifice was coming down the line. And he was making his offering as, an, as a reminder of that, all, that ultimate offering that was to come for sin that was going to be fulfilled in Jesus Christ. That's saving faith. But Cain, Cain was making a different kind of offering, right? If it's not faith, then it's what? By works. If it's not by faith, then it's by works. And uh, for whatever does not proceed from faith is sin, Romans 14, 23. So let's examine the two offerings uh, just real quick here between Cain and Abel a bit further, a little more exact here. Genesis 4, 3 through 5. Uh, back to Genesis chapter 4, 3 through 5. So flip back to that real quick. Okay, so in the course of time, it says, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. Face fall in anger, right? So uh, notice, notice this. Uh, God did not accept Cain or his offering. But he accepted Abel and his offering, right? This is saving faith that, that has active works involved, active offering, in other words, that it's displaying genuine love and affection for God. And because of that, it's bringing uh, the first fruits of it. It's bringing the fat portions of it. It's bringing the best that you have been given by God. Now you're taking that best and giving it to God, okay? And so Cain is just bringing an offering from his profession, from his livelihood. But Abel's bringing much more than that. Uh, it's pretty amazing what's going on there. Any, any offering that we bring to God um, like that, uh, you know, that, that just we just bring, you know, in other words, that we just kind of bring because that's what we're supposed to do, it doesn't display great affection for God, right? Uh, I think King David helps us out here in 2 Samuel 24, 24 to really kind of put a fine point on what's happening. He says, I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God that cost me nothing. That cost me nothing. Any offering that we bring to God that cost us nothing is just an empty religious activity void of genuine affection for God, right? Though we no longer bring burnt offerings and grain offerings to God, what type of offering do New Covenant Christians bring? What are we to bring to God as an offering? Well, the Bible tells us that, right? Romans 12.1. Romans 12.1. Listen to this. Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, an offering, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. You see that? Uh, check out 1 Peter 2, 5 and Hebrews 13, 15 through 16. Those will be helpful as well to see what kind of offering we bring to God. Um, but it's through the love of Christ we offer our entire lives, our entire lives to God, holding nothing back for ourselves. You don't see that very often. We see people say that, oh yeah, I believe in Jesus or I profess Christ, but they hold something back for themselves, don't they? Um, it, it, it's through Jesus we offer ourselves as a living sacrifice, made living by the sacrifice of Christ, made acceptable because Christ has given us his acceptance before the Father in exchange for our sin. So we're a living sacrifice acceptable to God because of the cross, because of the cross. And as Hebrews says, 
in Hebrews 13, we offer a continual sacrifice of praise to God. A sacrifice of praise. I love that. And we do not neglect to do good and share generously what God has so generously given us. You know, a sacrifice of praise indicates that one's praise is not circumstantial. Uh, it's not based on a lack of trial or it's not based on convenience. We offer a sacrifice of praise because God is worthy of our praise. And no matter what is going on in our life that's hard or difficult, God is good. God is good, and he has proven his goodness to us through his cross. He's displayed his love and affection for us through his cross, and therefore, whatever God brings into your life, and you're, you're deciding as judge and jury that it's not good, that means that you're living for something else, that you're living for something that you believe would be more satisfying than the cross of Jesus Christ, and you're not willing to offer a sacrifice of praise. Um, you're not willing to be uh, a life that is all in with Christ. You've still got something that you're holding back for yourself. Uh, the Apostle Peter says, you know, we offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. And think about this now. Uh, spiritual sacrifices, one of the things that we don't realize is that Jesus Christ, uh, when the Spirit of God reveals who he is, Christ comes and makes his home in our hearts. And sacrificially, uh, we make room for him. Sacrificially, we make room for Christ in our hearts, ridding ourselves of anything that is displeasing to him, no matter how precious that may be to us. You know, something that we've always held on to in our life, it's been our security or a sense of, you know, feeling like, you know, I, I'll be all right as long as I have this or that or whatever it is. You know, if we're unwilling to let go of that, to rid ourselves of it for the sake of pleasing Christ, there's no real way that Christ can be our treasure. Um, and, and Cain wasn't desiring to, to please God. He wasn't. He was holding back. He's bringing an offering that didn't really cost him anything. Instead, what was Cain's motive in his offering? What? Why do this, in other words? Why bring an offering if this is how you're going to be? Well, Jude 11 reveals what the motive is for Cain. Uh, Jude 11 says, Woe to them, for they walked in the way of Cain, in the way of Cain, and abandoned themselves uh, for the sake of gain. For the sake of gain. There's the motive right there, gain. Uh, what is the way of Cain? It's the way of gain. Uh, the way of gain is the root cause. Watch now. The way of gain is the root cause for face-fallen anger. That's why your face has fallen. You've sought something, you've sought this gain, something that you've got sinful ambitions to have personally in your life. It's a picture that you want to see come true for you. You've sought that, and it's been blocked, it's been stopped, it's become unfulfilled, and your face has fallen. Uh, it's the way of Cain. Matthew 16, 25, and 26 help us with this. Uh, Jesus says, for whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Watch now. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world, gains the whole world, and forfeits his soul? So break this down with me. This is the meat right here. When a person is seeking to save their life, they are seeking an outcome of their own designs. Something they desire to gain for themselves. And what happens when what they seek to gain is blocked or prevented or unfulfilled? Face fallen anger. There is a way that they want their life to be. And they are fighting for this instead of letting it go, denying it to take up their cross. They're fighting for it for the sake of their own gain instead of being willing to follow Christ as their only gain. Essentially, they're fighting with God, right? They're fighting with God. Cain was, the Bible says, Cain was of the evil one. 1 John 3.12 says, Cain was of the evil one, and uh, he displayed the evil one's prideful envy, you know, that prideful envy because, he, you know, Satan wanted what God had. And he was trying to ascend to that place. And he was mad, angry because it was blocked, right? He wasn't allowed to, to 
to ascend to the place of God. And so we have that kind of satanic anger in us, the way of Cain kind of anger, where we have this gain that we're seeking to ascend to, and God is opposing us. And we will do what Cain does. If we don't repent, we will do what Cain does, and we will ruin other people's lives to get what we want. We will. We'll ruin our kids' lives. We'll ruin whoever's in our path blocking us from getting what we want. We will ruin their lives. It's, it's as though we're willing to murder them. Cain murders his brother, Abel, right? And James 4, 1 through 2 says that when you desire and do not have, you murder. That's what happens. Uh, that's the way of Cain. You have some sacred goals uh, for your life, sacred ambitions that you seek to gain. Life's not going the way you want. You're going to make people pay. And the sun goes down on another day that you didn't get your way, and so that picture of the life that you want doesn't come true, right? And you're bitter. You're so bitter that that, that Hebrews 12, 15 bitterness that misses the grace of God kicks in, and, and you're willing to defile others. So sinful. That's face fallen. Uh, way of Cain anger. That's, uh, you know, why is your face fallen? It's it, Face fallen indicates a person whose hopes for the self have been defeated. And they feel sorry for themselves, unable to be consoled. They're just not able to be consoled. So whatever you're hoping, whatever you're hoping for, whatever your hope, uh, whatever hope you're holding on to, if it's not the hope of Christ, do you understand that it's the root cause for your anger. You're not anchored in Christ. Your hope is in something else. Your heart's sick because of that. You believe you have the right to be angry, to hold on to that anger, that you're entitled to that anger, that God should be doing something about this, but he is doing something about this. He's opposing you. He's opposing you. God opposes the proud. He is opposing you. And you know, when you're in this mode, this way of Cain, that's the most loving thing that God can do, is oppose you. When your ambitions are not for Christ to know his great salvation, when you're seeking an outcome of your own design, your soul is in trouble. You understand that? Your soul is in trouble. You're not right with God. You're in your guilt. You're in your sins. Uh, when you will not get over this, something's wrong. When you're seeking an outcome of your own design and you will not quit, something's wrong. Something's wrong. You're not right with God. It's the soul without the cover of Christ that can find no relief. You, you seek shelter in your own plan of salvation and you're just trying to funnel everyone and everything into that plan and they're not cooperating and your face has fallen in anger. The best thing you can do, the best thing you can do is to humble yourself and let go of your life. For the sake of what Christ has done, let go of your life. Christ gave his life to save yours. And through no merit of your own, you can be right with God through faith in Christ. Through faith in Jesus Christ. Stop and think. God was has every right to be angry with you. He has every right to pour his wrath on you, his anger, to be displayed um, because of the life that you're trying to live apart from him, because of the affections that you're trying to chase that are void of the affections of Christ or not desiring of Christ, but desiring of earthly gain. That's what you live for. And, and God has every right to pour his wrath out on you because of that. Yet he has made a way for you to be right with him through the cross of Jesus Christ. I know you got dreams. I know you got hopes. I know you got ambitions for yourself. But answer this question. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? Eternity is far greater than this temporary life of worldly ambition that you're seeking to live for. And Christ is so much more satisfying than any gain that you've got going on in your own heart and mind that you're trying to achieve, that you're trying others to, to get others to, to love too. What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? You're angry because you're not getting your way and your face has fallen, and your heart is sick with it. But Jesus Christ is the hope of the heart. 
And if you will repent and put your trust in Jesus Christ and turn from your gain to, so that you can receive from Christ, uh, Christ himself as your very great and precious reward, you can know a love that you could never arrange for yourself. Never. Ever. I want to see that for your life. Uh, I want to see the gospel saving love of Christ reach your heart. Um, cry out to God. Cry out to God. Ask him, beg him to save you from yourself. Um, as always, we're here for you, and um, we love you. We want to come alongside what God is doing in your life, what God is showing you, so that you can um, put down gospel roots in those things and have the Word of God be established in your life. That is, uh, North Park is a great place for that. Uh, if you're in this area, you need to find your way to our church so that you can uh, really uh, come uh, into the saving work of God through His Word. Uh, and that is preached at North Park Church. Um, look at our Sunday messages online. Look at our life group questions that follow up with that Sunday message. And tune into our midweek messages. And reach out to us. Make contact with us. And let us know how we can come alongside your life. We've got leaders standing by to do that. So please reach out to us. And we will uh, finish this lesson next week. And we'll talk about watching out for the religion of Cain. Watching out for the religion of Cain. Uh, we'll see you then.